Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I, I'll confess to you, when I was watching that, I wasn't tempted by fruit roll-ups, but if she had chocolate out there, <laughs> or ice cream, I would have definitely been tempted. Definitely ice cream. Um, let's pray together. Lord, we all face temptations, and we want to be able to resist them, but we need your help. With the scripture, Lord, I pray you teach us how to do that. And I pray you tell the scripture to come real in us. Let it become alive, not just something on a page, but something that's real. So it becomes the living word within us. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, how many of y'all remember the old Touched by an Angel show? Y'all remember that? Yeah, it's still popular on, on a lot of these reruns. Uh, in one of the episodes, Monica, the angel in training, goes to the wrong place by mistake. And as she's cleaning this place, she picks up a bag, the police come in, she's caught holding cocaine. As she's being interrogated, she says she's an angel. Well, they don't believe her, they think she's insane, so they send her to the mental institution. At the mental institution, she's put into a room with another lady who appears to be really, really out of it. And this lady says she's an angel and her name is Claire. And Claire is constantly saying, Mayday, 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 like she's reaching out to somebody. Well, in the course of events, Monica is appointed a court attorney, a court appointed attorney. And, and this attorney is named Jake Stone. Jake was a veteran of Vietnam, and he tells to Monica, I cannot believe in a God. If God is a loving God, why, how can there be all this evil in this world? Uh, and he said, there's just no way. But he also said that if there really was an angel, it had to be a lady named Claire that he met in Vietnam. Claire, he said, was just amazing at all she did with all her energy. He said, as they were being evacuated from Vietnam, he ran to get on the helicopter at the last minute, and holding his hand was a little girl named Mei Ling, who her nickname was Mayday. As they get on the helicopter, and the helicopter's flying away, Mei Ling falls, well, loses grasp, and she falls. And he looked down, and he saw Claire capture, catch her, and rescued her. He said, if there's an angel, it has to be Claire. Well, at that point, Monica obviously realizes the roommate she has at the mental institution is the same Claire. And she goes back to Claire and says, Claire, you are an angel of God. But you have forgotten who you are because you're so caught up in all the trauma that happened in Vietnam. Remember who you are. And she pleaded with her, remember who you are. You are an angel of God. And with that, Claire comes back. In walks Jake, and Claire says to Jake, Claire, I mean, at this point, you know, it's obvious she looks like an angel, how they do all that stuff. And, um, and Jake is caught by surprise and says, I have a message for you from God. And that is, 
I was supposed to give it to you while you were in Vietnam, but everything got in the way. The message is, God has been with you the whole time. You haven't seen it, but God has been with you the whole time you were there in Vietnam. And God still loves you, and God is still with you now. Well, have you ever had those times in which you're, you're listening to a song or listening to someone say something, you watch something, and then you feel like God's talking to you through it? That's what happened to me. At that particular time in my life, I was the director of the Council of Ministries for our conference. And the bishop wanted me to do these things, and the district superintendents wanted me to do these things, and all these committees, boards, agencies, task groups, and all special interest men, all the, and I was being torn everywhere. And it was just a miracle that I even sat down and watched that television show that night. And as I did, it was like God speaking to me. Skip, you have been so wrapped up with all these things that you're being defined as to who you are by all these things, you have forgotten who you are. You're my child. And a peace came over me that in the midst of whatever's going on, it, that peace still comes over me. That instead of being defined by others, a child of God. Now, what does this have to do with the temptations? The temptations of Jesus actually begins at his baptism. At the baptism, at the end of chapter 3, the scripture says in verse 17, the voice from heaven said, this is my son, my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Okay, so here's the voice of God that says, this is my son, I'm well pleased, and he knows who he is. The very next verse, verse 1, chapter 4, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Do you catch that? He was led by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. Now a lot of people say, why is God tempting me? That's not what the scripture said. He's led by the Spirit. Understand this. In James chapter 1, verse 13, it says, no one when tempted, you say, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and God tempts no one. Even Jesus himself taught us in the Lord's Prayer to say, to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So why does it have the appearance that God is leading him into the spirit, with the Spirit, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil? It's not that he's leading him to be tempted, he's putting him into the game and that game requires that there will be a fight, a temptation. You and I, once we become Christian, you and I, once we leave this worship service, we're not being tempted by God, but we will face temptations. Amen? We are going to face temptation. That's the battle. That's what he's going into. So he's going out to do battle. Now, as he goes out to do battle, notice the, his temptations. They are not the typical things we think about in terms of temptation, uh, being tempted to cheat, to gossip, to uh, just figures on the income tax, not uh, being tempted to look at guys who are naked or girls who are naked or having affairs, not tempted to get into drugs and alcohol, not tempted to get into vices. It's not any of those. Notice the three temptations. The first temptation is what we call the immediate. He says, if you are the son of God, turn the stone into bread. Now what's wrong with that? Nothing, really. But the temptation is to try to do something that is immediate, that produce immediate results, but not long-lasting. And Jesus responds by saying, man shall not live by bread alone. You know what it's like. You saw the children in the wilderness. God gave them manna from heaven, day after day after day, and they still complained. Just because we give food doesn't mean a person's gonna come to Christ, or our lives is gonna change. We see that with handouts all the time. The handouts need to be made. We still need to do that. But that is not going to change a person's life. And he recognizes that. The second temptation, the second battlefield, was to do what's called the expedient. Uh, you know, if you just jump off the temple, now understand what that means. The pinnacle of the temple, 
There's one corner of the temple that is 400 and feet high because it sits on the side of a mountain. That's one and a half football fields. So if Jesus jumps off the side of the temple, he says, you know, God's not going to let you die. The angels will catch you. And at that point, Jesus says, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I do that, yeah. All of a sudden, I'll be on the front page of the paper. I'll have people calling from all around the world. I'll be on the internet. I'll be on talk shows. I'll be, have a, uh, a song written about me. I can write a book. All these things. But you know what? I'll have to do something greater next time. And there's something greater next time. Just because people see me do something doesn't mean their lives are changed. The expedient doesn't change lives. So he says, he, what does he do? He quotes scripture and says, you shall not tempt the Lord. Now the third battlefield, the devil says, I'll tell you what, we can end this war. We can stop the fighting if we just compromise. Uh, I'll, I'll make a deal with you. You bow down and worship me and I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. Big problem with that is the kingdoms of the world were not the devil to give. We sing the song, this is our father's world, not this is the devil's world. We also sing uh, that the Lord is Lord of all creation, not the devil. So that's not something for the devil to get. But I want you to notice this. He reads the scripture, he quotes the scripture again, that you're to worship the Lord your God and only God do you serve, which means I'm not going to fall down and worship you. Now you get out of here. Now those were three skirmishes, three battles, but they really weren't the temptation. What was the temptation? The temptation is in the word if. If you are the Son of God, then turn the stone into bread. If you are the Son of God, jump off the temple. What's the devil trying to do? Take him back to his baptism and throw him off course and say, you know, why don't you doubt that you really are the Son of God? Now, let, let's translate it this way for you and me. Is anyone here a Christian? Raise your hand if you're a Christian, you're a follower of Christ. All right, the, the course of questions may be like this. If you are a Christian, then why do you give in to temptation so many times? If you are a Christian, then why don't you trust me with your life? If you're a Christian, why do you have so many doubts? If you are a Christian, why don't you do more for the Lord? If you're a Christian, why, why can't people tell it? And what's the devil trying to do there? To get us to doubt that we are children of God. That's the ultimate temptation. To doubt that we, in other words, to get us off the mark and not trust Christ. Now, the thing about it is, how do you answer that? You answer that by saying, well, yeah, I'm going to mess up. Paul says it so well. We all sin, fall short of the glory of God. But the issue is not that I'm going to mess up. The issue is there's someone who knows that. And they're with me anyway, and that's Jesus. We know the one who stays with us. Let's just go back to something we did about a couple of months ago. What do you see? Someone say it out loud. What do you see? The Bible. Yes, you see the Bible. But reality, if you remember, that's what you're focused on. What you see is a Bible that is being held by a hand that's attached to my arm and my body that's wearing these clothes behind a microphone, behind this pulpit, behind, in front of all this stuff behind. What you see is far greater than the Bible. The tendency for people, for all of us, including me, is for us to get so focused on the temptation, the mistake, the guilt, the shame, that we forget the big picture. And the big picture is, yes, I have messed up. But there is a hand of God that reaches out and forgives me anyway. And we stay in contact and not doubt that love of Christ. Now, that's one way that question is dealt with. If you are the Son of God, in other words, you're not worthy. You're not worthy. But the other way, the temptation is, if you're the Son of God, that means you've got power. 
And with power, you can turn these stones into bread. You can jump off the temple and not be hurt and because you've got power. And I know a lot of people who are so good as Christians. They are such good leaders, such good teachers, such good whatever. They're just so good, and they get to the point, you know what? I am so good. It's not going to hurt that if I sin this one time. It's not going to hurt if I cheat this one time. It's not going to hurt if I... And what we tend to do is we take our eyes off our relationship with God, and we focus on, look at me. Look what I can do. And we begin to feel somewhat invincible. Like everything's going nice in my life right now. I am okay. All is good. I don't need the Lord. And all of a sudden, ooh, we get zapped. Now, I, I don't remember the man's name, but he, he told about watching an eagle out west. As he was watching this eagle just graciously flying through the sky, this day he saw all of a sudden the eagle swoop down and grab a badger and picked the badger up and started flying. And then all of a sudden, as he was flying, he, he noticed the eagle looked like it was flying to a cliff where the badger couldn't get away. And as he's flying, all of a sudden, the eagle took a nosedive, crashed into rocks, killing both it and the badger. Well, it wasn't too far from where he was, so he ran over to the site where the crash was, and as he got to the crash, he saw what happened. If you know what a badger is, a badger has skin that is so thick, so loose, that even though it's facing you right now and I come to the back and I grab it, I can grab it, but it is so loose that the badger, while I'm holding it, can turn all the way around and attack. It's a defensive mechanism that God gave badgers. The thing about it, he saw, was that the badger, the eagle grabbed it, saying, look what I've got. And he's flying into the air, but the badger turned and ate out the tummy, causing them both to crash. Get the point? You and I can be so confident like an eagle that we grab that sin, think, ah, it's not going to hurt, and then we crash. The wages of sin is death. 1 Corinthians 15. It's the Word of God. And you and I have seen it time and time again with teachers, coaches, pastors, youth directors, scout leaders, uh, people in leadership, politicians. Ah, oh, it's not going to get caught, and all of a sudden it crashes. Or your spouse or your child catches you, it crashes. It hurts. It's disaster. So what do we do with it? How do we keep from getting off target? Well, notice what Jesus did. Two things. First of all, he stayed with the Spirit. The Scripture said he was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. That meant the Spirit was with him. He did not depart from the Spirit. That's so important. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 reads, He, referring to Jesus, who is in us, is greater than he, referring to the devil, who is in the world. So, very simply, very clearly, like Jesus, stay in tune with Christ. Whatever you do, seek first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness. Second thing he did was he kept quoting scripture. Now, I know a lot of us just don't think there's much power in the Bible. I know that. You've told me it's just the Bible, just words. No, it's not. There is power there. And, and honestly, for years, I didn't believe there was either. But then the more I learned the Bible... The more I heard God speak through scriptures that were in my mind. You've had those times where you've heard a nudge that says, turn the other cheek, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That nudge that says, all things are possible with Christ. You're saved not by what you do, but by the grace of Christ. If God is for us, who can be against us? Uh, in verse after verse after verse, God speak to us through the scriptures. So what do we do with it then? First of all, expect temptation. The moment you leave here, the, the worst crowd, any restaurant waiter or waitress will tell you, the worst crowd is the Sunday lunch. It's the Sunday lunch from church members. Expect to be tempted to do the obnoxious stuff. And so expect it, you've got to get ready for it. And as Paul says, 
Ephesians chapter 6, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his power put on the whole armor of God. Why? Because you're going to expect it. So that you'll be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day. And having done everything to stand firm. And then he says, put on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. Take the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, helmet of salvation. And then he ends in verse 17, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Expect it to come, but be ready. The second thing, detect it. Expect it, but then detect it. How do you detect it? 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Test the spirits to see whether they are of God. Test it. Expect it. Detect it. The third thing, reject it. How do you reject temptation? You cannot de reject temptation by saying, I reject you. I'm going to turn my back on you. No. You reject it by turning towards Christ. For by turning towards Christ, your back is against that. Seek first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness. Now, what do you do if you fail? Is there anyone who's never failed temptation? We all have. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. So what do we do? 1 John chapter 1. If you have sin, confess your sin. And he will be faithful and just and will forgive your sin and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Today, I don't want you to leave without confessing that you've got temptations and you need help. Don't try to do this alone. Seek the help from Christ. And then finally, finally, above all, stay and remember you are a child of God. Remember that. Parents, is there any parent here who has Never had a single problem ever in your life with your child. No. <laughs> your mom didn't raise her hand, Hannah. <laughs> oh, you did, okay. <laughs> of course, but we still love our children. God loves every one of us in spite of our sin. Confess it. He will forgive us. Um, I forget the guy's name, but he was a doctor as a prisoner of war in World War II in the Japanese prison camp, prisoner of war camp. The water around the prison camp was contaminated. The soldiers' infections were becoming worse. The wounds were becoming infected because of the water. They were becoming sick. They were dying because of it. This doctor looked for a way to get out of it. Then he remembered. Why didn't I remember this sooner, he thought. The place was surrounded by coconut trees. He remembered from years earlier that the water inside of a coconut, and when it, especially before it's ripe, is sterile, pure water. And I don't know how they did it, but he said they broke open those coconuts, and they started drinking that water, and they started dealing with the wounds with the pure water and they started getting well and healthier but he said what was really interesting was that these coconut trees drank from the same water and it didn't kill them but those coconut trees purified the water to provide pure water for the people to drink and he thought you know that's the way it is with Christ you and I may be sin but Christ can transform us into people who are the children of God, perfect in the eyes of God. Will you pray with me? Now, on the back of your eyelids, I want you to look at an image of Jesus or an image of God on the throne or an image of the cross. Doesn't matter, just look. And I want you to notice and I want you to hear the voice of God say, you are, you are my beloved child. 
I love you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I am with you. And I want you to hear the voice of God saying, I know you sinned. Just confess it to me. I know the struggle you're going through right now. I know the temptations you're dealing with right now. I know what's in your mind. But again, I still love you. Nothing you will do will separate your love from me, my love from you. Now, give me your sin. Give me your temptation. Give me your hand. For I can be in you greater than he, than this world. Let me purify you. Let me make you strong. Lord Jesus, I pray that every one of us leave today cleansed, and in bold confidence that we are your children, confidence that we are worthy of your love, but not overconfident that we don't need you. Lord, help us remember that you are. You are our Father. We are your children. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen.